Hi, y'all. Let's chat a little bit about the IG report on James Comey and uh, his memos. So, uh, in a couple of videos over the last few years, I've mentioned that uh, Trump is not, in my view, more dishonest than your average reporter, uh, than the news media is. I think one of the reasons they're upset with him isn't because he's dishonest, it's just that he's not very sophisticated about how he, you know, spins a, a tale. Just whatever goes through his mind comes right out, or as uh, Senator John Kennedy puts it, Trump is uh, uncomfortable with an unexpressed thought that goes through his head. So whatever goes through just comes right out of his mouth. Uh, the media tends to be much more sophisticated in how it misleads. It'll say something in order to mislead people that is factually true, so that way if you call them on it, they can say, well, if you look at what we said, it's actually true. Nevertheless, it will cause a person to believe the exact wrong thing, which is precisely why it's worded in the way that it's worded. So on the uh, the, re the release of the report, um, CNN has uh, this guy named Eli Honig, however you pronounce his name, who wrote for them talking about that this is an example of, or this uh, report is a no, nobody wins. It doesn't vindicate Trump, and it, uh, the only thing it really does to Comey is say, you know, you violated departmental policy, naughty, naughty. Uh, this is not true. This is actually a win for the president, uh, and it's not very good news. I mean, it's good news for Comey that there doesn't seem to be an indictment coming, but, uh, you know, that's just because the prosecution was declined. So I have uh, had a number of people that have tell me, and I've seen it said uh, between other people in conversations I've observed but haven't participated in, that the OIG report, the Inspector General's report, uh, does not find that, uh, that Comey violated the law, that Horowitz doesn't believe he violated the law, that he, uh, he wasn't prosecuted by OIG because he didn't violate the law. Variations on that theme. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, the CNN guy I just quoted a little while ago, is a former prosecutor, so he knows what he's saying here is an absolutely uh, blatant misrepresentation of reality. But I'll just go ahead and read it, and then we'll get back to the, the meat of the issue. He says, While the OIG does not find that Comey's conduct merits prosecution, it does conclude that Comey's retention, handling, and dissemination of certain memos uh, violated department and FBI policies and his FBI employment agreement. Uh, the OIG report is harshly critical of Comey, and rightly so. No, it does not appear Comey committed a crime, for instance, by knowingly leaking classified materials. And Comey made a hollow claim of vindication on Twitter, uh, generously offering to accept to uh, accept quick sorry messages in lieu of formal apologies. Uh, but it's no small it is no small matter for the director of the FBI, who titled his memoir "A Higher Loyalty to Violate uh, Policy of the Very Organization He Leads or Led." Okay, so the the two major threads there. Or the first one is that. Uh, the OIG does not find Comey's conduct merits prosecution, and the other is, uh, based on this report, that it does not appear that Comey violated the law. Now, the first, the first claim is literally true. The OIG does not find, in other words, the finding in the report does not say, this conduct merits prosecution. It does not utter those words. Those words are not written down by Horowitz. They're not encanted by anyone on, on the investigative team, so far as I know. Uh, but that is a complete misrepresentation of the issue because OIG has no statutory authority to make prosecution decisions, to recommend prosecutions. It finds facts and makes uh, referrals of those facts to the relevant agency, the relevant part of an agency, to do with what it, whatever it is uh, they think they should have to do. Uh, normally that's just on administrative personnel issues. Uh, after the investigation is completed, you make your findings of fact, you send it to the agency, and the agency decides uh, whether or not to punish the person after the facts have been determined. But it does not make prosecutorial decisions. Uh, if you watch inspectors general testify before Congress, they lament this fact often that they don't have any prosecution authority because they will find a you know course of very serious misconduct. And what happens at the end of it is that the agency decides what we're going to do is absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, even if it's, it, even if a statute is violated, they'll say, oh, we're not going to do anything. So the, uh, this Eli guy, or however you pronounce his name, it's E-L-I-E, -E, uh, is totally using that to misrepresent the, the uh, state of affairs, which even if he didn't have the last paragraph, you would, if you know anything about the law and what uh, uh, inspectors general do, you would immediately know that he's you know, just trying to shine people on to get them to draw the inference that the OIG does not think that Comey violated the law, which is exactly opposite of what the OIG actually thinks Comey did. And the way, uh, but 
assuming that you don't know that, uh, that, that his intent is to state that so the way people will draw the, represent, draw the inference, no crime, uh, go down to the end of it where he says, uh, the OIG report is harshly critical uh, and it does not appear Comey committed a crime. So that his goal is to uh, you know, make you doubt that Comey did anything unlawful while nevertheless hammering him for violating policies. So that's, that's the narrative that's being spun. And it's come to me in a, a number of different guises on Twitter. I've seen you know, people talking about it here and there. Comey did no crime. The only thing Comey did was violate a policy. Things of that nature. This is absolutely false. Um, <clears throat> the OIG report, well, before I even get to what the OIG report says, there were seven memos in total that Comey wrote uh, about his interactions with the president. Uh, these are things that he wrote afterwards about the substance of what they discussed. And uh, of, I think seven memos of them, some contained classified information, others did not contain classified information. Sometimes he, class, he you know, documented that it was classified information that was contained in it, and other times he did not document that there was classified information contained in the documents uh, that he wrote. Um, so you've got those factual issues going on. I.G. Horowitz and his team looked through all of this, and they, uh, they set out the timeline very carefully as to how, you know, when Memo 1 was written, when Memo 2 was written, right on down the line, uh, to whom they were distributed, both within the government and without the government, uh, his classification markings uh, and his failures, his failure to uh, classify classified material is classified. So they go through all of that. And it's, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, there's seven memos. Now, before I touch on these memos, in previous videos, I've talked about how in law enforcement, if, when you watch television programs or the movies, what the investigators seem to always be after, the holy grail of, of uh, police work, is getting a confession from a defendant or a suspect. That's not true, uh, as I've mentioned. It's, of course, good to get a confession. I mean, you know, if a person's willing to give one, then by all means take it. I mean, that's it's good evidence. But a person who confesses always has the argument in court that he was coerced by law enforcement. He was pressured unduly by law enforcement to falsely confess to a crime he did not commit. Juries will sometimes believe that, and they'll discount the, uh, the confession and find it uh, uh, not guilty. So what you really want to find, like the holy grail of uh, an investigation where you're interrogating someone, is when they make a false exculpatory claim. That is, in, whereas in the one case they could be pressured into lying to say they're guilty to make the police stop abusing them, and people get that argument. This is the case where they're lying without being pressured to lie in order to make themselves look like they are innocent. And once a person engages in that conduct of telling a lie to cover up their bad conduct, juries tend to look very, uh, not, the juries tend not to be very friendly to false exculpatory uh, claims of that nature. And they say, well, you know, in all, when he didn't have to lie, he could have pled the fifth, whatever, you know, whatever it happens to be. This guy decided to tell a lie in order to throw people off. He decided to withhold information that he was required to uh, disclose, or whatever it is, in order to make himself look like he was the good guy. That's exactly what Comey did, and it's laid out very carefully in I.G. Horowitz's report. And you don't have to go far into the report on this. I've had a number of people who haven't obviously read the report say to me things like, uh, well, have you read the report? If you did, you'd know that the I.G. doesn't find that he committed a crime, things of that nature. It's like, well, I have read the report. You obviously haven't. And uh, the way I know you haven't is because on page two and three, it's uh, what you're saying is not quite true. Uh, you, you don't need to really get into the weeds to figure out where it is. It's not hidden in some footnote on page 62 or something. It's page two and page three, and then a little bit later on, you get into the, uh, the timeline. So the Eli Honig guy who was writing for CNN that uh, OIG did not find that what Comey did merits prosecution and that it does not appear that Comey committed a crime incident to the IG's report. There is a statute, uh, we have a number of these things in, in the world called statutes, and they set out, uh, some, some uh, require you to do things, like you must pay your taxes, so those are ones that coerce you to take some action. And then you have others that say you may not do this. They coerce you to not take action. They say you must abstain from doing this, in our judgment, bad thing. Federal agencies, on the other hand, uh, have more extensive rules than are contained in the United States Code. Uh, there's the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, and there are also internal policies for administrative matters and whatnot. And their internal 
their internal operating procedures will have a lot of do's and don'ts. And the don'ts, or the do's, are very, they cover at a minimum what are the statutory requirements. You must do this within this amount of time. You may not do this, like there's a uh, departmental policy against sexual harassment. It's not simply that it's a policy against sexual harassment. It's that the law prohibits you from doing that. You may not ask these types of questions because the law prohibits you from asking these types of questions. You may not disclose this information because the law says you may not disclose this information. So it's not enough to say that he, he violated the uh, policy, therefore no crime. That's not true. Very often the policy is what it is because a statute compels that behavior or uh, requ you know, what, whether it t compels you to do something or to abstain from doing something. And with respect to classification uh, matters, the, the statute says, uh, the president shall, enumer will, shall uh, make a proclamation of the various kinds of uh, classifications and people who knowingly disclose it get this, people who reckless, uh, with gross negligence uh, do this, will get the other thing, but whatever it is that goes into the executive order uh, on the classification systems, that's what, that's what the statute is. So the executive order covering classified materials, what counts and what doesn't, is if you break it, you are violating a policy directive over the president. But there's a statute that says whatever the president says in that policy, once it's proclaimed by the president, is incorporated into the statute and becomes, uh, it, it carries the force of law. So if you do the thing the policy says you may not do on classified material issues, that's a crime. Okay, so that's a lot of what you get in federal agency uh, policy manuals. That there will be some rule, some law somewhere that says, and the secretary of the department concerned, or the attorney general, whatever you know, whatever agency it is, shall promulgate rules that uh, give effect to this uh, statute, and the substantive provisions of that will be incorporated into the statute, or the uh, the interpretation of it, I should say, will be what the courts will follow, so long as it's not blatantly unreasonable to follow it. It's something called Chevron deference for the Code of Federal Regulations when an agency is tasked with coming up with the rules, the uh, courts will defer to the agency's judgment because they are ostensibly in the best position to know what the proper rules are. Uh, at least they're better at it than the judges. That's the theory. Anyway, so uh, going through Comey's uh, list of things, he uh, discloses to his friend lawyer and then his, that lawyer friend uh, discloses to other people certain memos that Comey uh, drafted. Uh, relevant here, there are four of them. Uh, two contained classified information. I think I think it was two. I could be getting it wrong. Anyway, at least one of them contained classified information that he redacted. Uh, uh, so when Comey says, you know, or when people say that he did not, uh, as Comey did say, that uh, the OIG has found that I did not disclose publicly to the media classified information, leak to the media classified information, which is of course true, he redacted out of memo number seven a paragraph that had classified material in it. Uh, so that, it, that's one of the materials that he gave to his lawyer, which he was not authorized to do. And this is important. The, uh, one of them contained classified information that was not redacted, which Comey did disclose to his lawyer, who was not authorized to receive it, which is, you know, that Comey wrote this memo uh, and it contained uh, classified material in it in relation to a conversation he'd had with the president, which he then disclosed to his lawyer. Uh, so there's, that's one thing. Another thing that I've mentioned is the false exculpatory statement. Comey made false exculpatory statements. He testified before Congress three weeks after he disclosed these four memos to his uh, counsel, who he's, who he's claiming is his counsel, and then two other, his counsel gave it to two other lawyers, he testified in Congress that he disclosed one memo to uh, this friend with instructions to pass it along to the media, and that one didn't contain any classified information. He did not tell them that he, he disclosed three other memos, one of which did contain unredacted classified information. He concealed that uh, when he was, he had an obligation, to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and so when he's representing what his actions were, he has intentionally neglected three instances in which he also disclosed memoranda, which he was not authorized to disclose, one of which contained classified materials, which he either did know or should have known it was a classified bit of information because he had just come from a classified meeting with the president on this very uh, issue. 
and uh, he did not properly uh, put things on the top. He did not properly document it. You have to put uh, your class, the classification level at the top and bottom, and then you do portion markings, putting the details off to the side. Uh, he failed to do that, and then he removed those materials from the FBI and stored them, uh, not in a secure place like is required, but just in his house in his own personal safe, not in a skiff. So, and he kept these after he left government service. That's another violation of the law. So you've got the false exculpatory statement, that is to say that when he's testifying before Congress about what it was that he did, he conceals the disclosure of classified information to a person, not authorized to receive it. He conceals the disclosure of three memos to a person who's not authorized to receive it. Uh, and then, of course, the one memo that he did uh, confess to disclosing without uh, you know, permission and with instructions to, to leak it to the media. So there, there's that. You have, uh, you, it, let me say, allegedly. You have uh, alleged perjury. You have allegedly disclosing without authorization classified materials to a person who is not entitled by law or regulation or rule to, to receive it. Uh, he did not properly document the things. He didn't put secret or confidential at the top and the bottom like you're supposed to. He didn't do his portion marking. So it's improperly uh, annotated. He did not store it in, a, in an authorized system like he's required to. So there are a lot of things there that, that he did uh, he did wrong. There's one other on that vein um, with, the, with the disclosure bit. Of the, oh, and he retained documents that are government uh, of property of the United States government after he left service in violation of the law. Now, what does this all mean? Well, you go read, I think, page two of the uh, IG's report. It could be page three, but I think it's page two. And it says that uh, the matter was referred to the Department of Justice, which declined to prosecute. Whenever you see that, that an issue is referred to the Department of Justice, which declined to prosecute in, in the body of an, inspector's gen, an Inspector General report, that language is there for a reason, and it's because there's a, there's a statute, of which we have many. It's, title five, it's a, an appendix to Title V of the U.S. Code. It's Part 3, Section 4, uh, Subparagraph D, which says that an inspector general conducting a proper investigation shall expeditiously report to the attorney general whenever he comes across evidence that, is, uh, that uh, he reasonably believes indicates there has been a criminal violation of federal criminal law. That's when it's returned, return, referred to the department for uh, a prosecutorial decision. So the guy is right that the OIG report does not find, the OIG does not find that it merits prosecution. He doesn't have statutory authority to do that. His statutory duty is to send it to the prosecutors to make that decision. He must do it. So whenever, uh, so it's true, the IG did not do what he's not authorized by statute to do, but the guy is concealing the fact, and as a lawyer he should know this, especially as a former federal prosecutor, that the IG is making the referral to the, uh, to the department for a prosecutorial decision precisely because the IG believes a crime was committed. He believes he has evidence which, if substantiated, shows that this person acted in a criminal manner. Now, whether that's in the dissemination of classified information to his lawyer friend, can't say. Whether it's the perjury thing, can't say. Whether it's the failure to properly store this, couldn't, can't say. Whether it's, to, uh, whether it's unlawfully keeping the documents after you've left service, can't say. That kind of thing. Now, how does, how does the FBI come to learn about these other memos that uh, have been unlawfully, or at least in violation of policy, disclosed, one of which unlawfully disclosed, allegedly? It's because uh, after Comey said that uh, he gave the one memo to, and say to the person's name, the FBI contacts that person, who then informs him, well, actually, he gave us more than that. Uh, he gave us four times as much. Um, and one of the reasons for doing that is not just, oh, hey, Mr. FBI, I'm really friendly. It's because once he is aware that Comey is, is uh, concealing that information from in the Congress and from the FBI, uh, by the way, with respect to the FBI, Comey turned over his unlawfully kept documents. He gave those back to the FBI, and then he did not tell the FBI that he has sent copies of those to someone else. He concealed that from the FBI agents who came to recover the materials. This friend of his slash lawyer discloses it because uh, it, had he failed to do that, he could be, very well be prosecuted for misprision of felony. That is to say that he has 
when, uh, well, you can look it up, but essentially if you help someone who is covering up a crime, uh, conceal the evidence of crime, conceal the evidence, keep it from investigators when you shouldn't, you can be prosecuted for that uh, when it helps the principal, of, the principal offender, and it's called misprision of felony. So uh, his lawyer promptly discloses that to the FBI. Now that's not, that doesn't violate attorney-client privilege because the handing over of a document is not a communicative act. It doesn't say anything. But uh, the, that he gave me these materials, yes, I, I, can't I can't withhold that from you, Mr. FBI agent. I must tell you that I am in a receipt of more than what my client has told you, or my alleged client has told you he has done. So, uh, particularly because it's property of the United States government, the, uh, he can't keep copies of it. So the FBI uh, then promptly goes and recovers the, uh, the materials from the lawyer, goes through the computer and sanitizes it uh, for classified information of all three of the, all three of the lawyers. So uh, let, let's review. He discloses four memos, uh, tells Congress he discloses one memo, which by the way, is literally true. If you disclose four memos, it follows, it, it's, called, it's called a fortiori, uh, you have disclosed one memo. But the failure to state I disclosed a second memo and a third memo and a fourth memo is, that's, that's the, uh, the chicanery there, that's the, the, the misrepresentation when you have a duty to give complete and accurate information, not just things that are strictly true. Um, if, you want to, if you want to play that game of, well, this is literally true, even though it will mislead someone, uh, you, you will find uh, many con artists are in prison for saying things that are literally true, but stated in a way that would mislead a person uh, to you know, unlawfully gain access to some of their materials money, whatever, you know, money, property, whatever happens to be. So the fact that a statement is factually true it does not answer the question of whether or not it is a completely accurate account in, in, in uh, compliance with the law. Another thing about people who have access to classified materials and other sensitive uh, government documents is that they have to, they're required to report certain things about it, and uh, Comey was concealing that, that he had disclosed it. He was concealing uh, th these types of things, both from the Congress and from the FBI. So, <clears throat> whether or not, uh, well, it seems the department doesn't think that they're going to go forward with the case, whether that, that is because they think it would be hard to prove up, or they just don't have any interest in it, I can't say. I don't think the case would be hard to prove, frankly, but I don't know everything the FBI knows, and I also don't know what materials they would have to disclose in court if they were to undertake the prosecution for uh, the classified bid. And this it goes back to my Hillary Clinton uh, comments of some years ago about her emails. It's rare that uh, prosecutions are brought over um, mishandling uh, classified materials. And the reason for it is because if you want to say that this person you know, did something wrong with this classified material, gave it to someone he shouldn't have given it to, left it on the street, whatever it happens to be, the material, the information in the material the document itself is evidence, and you cannot dis you can't keep it away from the defense. You can't re I mean, you can refuse to introduce it, and you lose your case. If you want to win your case, you'll have to introduce it in open court, which means that the jury gets to see it, the public gets to see it, the media gets to see it. It becomes a it, it will be disclosed right there in open court, and uh, I've talked about this before, but it was the the trial of the uh, Ethelbergs. Rosenbergs, <laughs> Ethelbergs, <laughs> the Rosenbergs, when they were being prosecuted for, dis, uh, for, for being spies, one of the things that they uh, allegedly had been uh, leaking to the Soviets was the designs of our nuclear weapons. And uh, when the trial happened, they wanted to have a, uh, I should mention, uh, you know, the Constitution guarantees you a right to a public trial, okay? That's why when the evidence is disclosed, the courts aren't closed. Uh, the appellate courts look very, dis they, they, do, it is, uh, they do not look favorably on closed proceedings, and so even a partial closer, closure can be grounds for reversing a conviction. So you need to be very, very careful about this. Now, the Constitution says you have a right to a public trial. It doesn't say you have an obligation to have a public trial. So if you want to waive your right to a public trial, and uh, you're free to do that. But independently, of what you, of whether or not you will waive your, your right to a public trial, the media has an independent right under the First Amendment 
to have access to government documents, to be there for the proceedings. Uh, the, the default rule is that judicial proceedings are open to the public, certainly to the media. So when the Rosenbergs were being prosecuted, and there was the dis this disclosure that needed to be made of how our nuclear bomb worked, it was, you know, he here's the schematic of the device. And, you know, uh, the defense said, you know, we don't want this public, uh, so you can close the court, uh, and it won't get out. The media says, not so fast. They may not want a public trial, and the government may go along with their not wanting to have a public trial, but we have this independent right to be present. And so the long and the short of it was that the, uh, the argument from counsel that the media should be excluded was rejected. The government's argument that the media be uh, gagged was rejected. That they had been enjoined not to disclose any national secrets, that was rejected. The, judge, the judge's injunction to the media with respect to how our nuclear bomb worked was, I will enjoin them to good taste or good judgment. I will not enjoin them to silence. And a, so he says, media people, Soviets may or may not have this. I don't know. I think they do. Possibly not. Whatever. I can't say. Uh, I am, I'm am trusting it to your good judgment to not disclose our national secrets. But obviously, you, the First Amendment is what it is. I will not restrain you. So that how our nuclear device worked was you know, it could have been disclosed publicly by journalists. They decided not to do it. Why the, why the Rosenbergs did this, I'm not entirely sure, because there's something called gray mail, and that's when you are accused of espionage or doing something wrong with classified materials. The classified document, or the materials, it might not just be a document, it could be other media, the classified media or the evidence. And the gray mail works like this. All right, Mr. Prosecutor, you want to prosecute me, I'm going to get in the court record before the public every bit of classified information that I possibly can. I'm going to make this hurt for you. So you, you claim this material is seriously damaging to the United States' interest, to our vital interests, that it would cause whatever level of damage it is for the level of classification. If you really believe that, you better think twice, because it's going to be put out there for everybody in the world to see. And that's often a very effective argument, because usually the materials that are classified, uh, that people are going to want to leak, are important. And the government's going to say, well, you know, yeah, some people who we don't want to have it do have it, but, uh, you know, that's not an argument that we should then go ahead and disclose it as widely as possible. So gray mail is often effective because the materials are properly classified, which means that their disclosure publicly would cause harm to United States interests, and so prosecutors will beg off of a prosecution. Maybe that's what was up with Comey. I don't know. Uh, but it is certainly the case that he did disclose classified information. Now, in contrast to the uh, Hillary Clinton issue, Comey wrote these memos. These aren't things that got forwarded to him or sent to him, which he forwarded along or replied to and may have missed something because they weren't properly, you know, they didn't have the proper headers and all the, you know, the markings that you're supposed to have. Whereas that was the case with Clinton, that the classified materials that she had, she did not create, she did not put in there and send off. They were sent to her uh, without proper headers, which is a way to get around it, but um, the, to get around the statute, because they have to be, the reason that these headers are required and the various notifications are required is because we don't do trial by ambush in the United States. The material that you send someone, they have to know that it's classified material before they can be said to be mishandling it. And the way that we make people aware uh, in documents that the material is classified is that it's written everywhere, secret, you know, top secret, confidential, whatever it happens to be, and then the various restrictions that it may have. Or, in a voice meeting, the meeting will start off with this information is classified. Um, so, people are put affirmatively on notice that the information that you're about to get is contained in this document, or on the CD, or that I'm going to say in this meeting, is classified. You now no longer have the defense that you did not know the material was classified. You now know that it is classified and uh, you must treat it accordingly. Comey doesn't have that excuse. This isn't something that someone sent to him. This is something that he created. He knew what the information was. Uh, he put it in there after coming out of a classified meeting. So he has no excuse in that, that way. Um, so there's that. Uh, 
there could be any number of reasons that they don't prosecute. It, it could just be the fact that, you know, if you're a high enough level official, they say, oh, we don't care what you do wrong. Um, the FBI has in the past made some interesting choices with respect to leaving vulnerable uh, classified information. There's a guy named Robert Hansen, who's the worst spy, the most damaging spy we've ever had. After learning that he was a spy, the way the FBI decided to entrap him was not by, you know, leaking him false classified information and having him disclose it. It was by promoting him to a position where he had unfettered access to all classified information at the, at the, uh, that the Department of Justice, that the FBI had access to, which included all the nukes, uh, defense plans, it included submarine schematics, I mean, everything. And then they were going to let him take it and then try to catch him in the act of passing it off. Fortunately, they caught him trying to pass it off rather than him slipping through their fingers and giving away, you know, oh, here are, here's how our subs work, here are, here's how you find them, uh, here's our new the new way we do our bombs, you know, but they gave him access to everything. So they don't always make the best decisions, but usually when they make the stupid decisions like that, it's for the purpose of getting a prosecution rather than making a stupid decision not to prosecute. But, you know, they don't make a, they don't make public why they don't prosecute. They don't make declination uh, statements usually. Comey did. Usually they don't. So I have no idea why it, why it is. Uh, it could just be to protect the, cl the classified information. Um, it could be it could be any number of reasons. It, it could just be the fact that uh, it hasn't gone through final review yet, and while it was originally declined to be prosecuted, it's being reviewed now by a different uh, prosecutor, say one who's looking into the FISA bit, uh, who might want to take it up, or because the FISA bit isn't done yet, and that's that would be much easier to do without running the risk of any of the classified material, just wait for that investigation to be finished, and then seek a prosecution for those uh, crimes such as they may have been committed. So that could be an, that could be why, or maybe the uh, the prosecutor just wants to save it all but once uh, after that investigation is completed and bring it all and uh, you know you know uh, at one time. Who knows why why it is the case? All we know is that uh, the IG fulfilled his statutory obligation to to uh, expeditiously report to actually to the AG but to the Department of Justice that uh, he reasonably believes that the facts he has uncovered uh, constitute a violation, a criminal violation of federal criminal law, and now the department must make a prosecutorial decision about whether or not to pursue that matter or whether or not to decline that matter, and he says they declined. So anyone who tells you that this thing clears Comey, it doesn't. Uh, the IG report uh, contains that language precisely because I, the IG found information which is sufficient, in his view, to support a prosecution. Otherwise, he wouldn't be re he wouldn't reasonably think that there was a violation of federal criminal law. After all, the guy is a great attorney. He used to be a prosecutor. So, anyone who says that to you is either ignorant or a liar or both. Anyone who says that uh, the the IG report does not find that it merits a prosecution is probably trying to mislead you, uh, but is certainly uh, who knows that the a person who says that, oh God, a couple different ways to say this. So a person who says that the report doesn't find that this merits prosecution is trying to you know, deceive you in a couple different ways or is just ignorant. One, the first way is that uh, by not telling you that, oh, by the way, they never tell you whether or not it does or doesn't merit prosecution. It exceeds their ambit. Uh, I'm sorry, it exceeds their remit, so they don't do that. That's what they, they make the referrals for, for the prosecutorial arm to do its bit, which this prosecutor did. So, I'm sorry, what's this IG did? So they're trying to do it that way uh, to get you to believe that the, that this isn't as bad as, as it is and, and saying that Comey did something. Uh, they just don't know that. And so you have to evaluate the likelihood that the person you're talking to is educated in the subject. If the person is a lawyer, particularly an ex-federal prosecutor, that person has, uh, like, n there's nothing to stand on as, uh, for this to be a slip-up, uh, careless wording in an article. This is a deliberate attempt to represent a false state of affairs by saying, by knowingly telling you a fact that is true without telling you the complementary fact, which would make it obvious that you're being misled, namely in that that's not the IG's job. They don't recommend, they don't say whether or not this merits prosecution. That's what the prosecutors do. They say this recommends being looked at. Uh, this merits a review because I have uncovered information that I think is sufficient to lead me to believe there is a violation 
of a criminal, federal criminal statute. So that's what I have to say about uh, that. All right, have a great day.